Apple has tried to tell consumers that they can replace their computers with an iPad for a while now. But alongside the latest iPad Pro that was just released, they finally gave into giving it a feature that might really help that concept. They gave iPad OS mouse support and even launched their own new Magic Keyboard cover with a trackpad built in. Well, while the Magic Keyboard isn't coming for a while, I did at least order the new iPad Pro and I've been using it long enough to do a complete walkthrough on it. Now, if you aren't familiar, a complete walkthrough on this channel is where I try to go through every single feature I possibly can on a new device so that you guys are better prepared should you be in the market to actually go buy one. With that said, there's a lot to go through. So, let's get started with the hardware. The new iPad comes in two screen sizes, 11 inches and 12.9 inches, which is the one that I have here. Both models are identical though in every way except for the size of the screen, duh, the weight, also duh, and the battery size. So, this video should still work for you regardless of which one you're checking out. Compared to the previous iPad Pro 2018 models, the dimensions are exactly the same, except for the weight that is increased by about 10 grams for the 12.9 inch model and less than five grams or so for the 11 inch model. The screen is an LED IPS panel with a 264 pixel per inch resolution. So 2732 by 2048 on this 12.9 inch model. It has a 120 Hertz refresh rate, Apple calls it ProMotion, and covers 100% of the DCI P3 color gamut. It also has an anti-reflective coating with Apple claiming just 1.8% reflectivity and it can hit 600 nits of brightness. All of this is identical to the 2018 iPad Pro, by the way. Also, supposedly they all have a fingerprint resistant coating on them, but well, I don't think I've ever seen a smudge-free iPad screen, right? Something to note about this screen though that's more subtle when comparing it to all of the other non-Pro models is that the edges are rounded instead of square. Above or uh, to the left, depending on how you're using it, we have our true depth front facing camera. This is a seven megapixel camera with an F2.2 aperture. And this is what it looks like and what the microphones sound like. Now I'm right now looking at the camera, it's in landscape mode and so it's on the left. If I look at the screen though, this is what that looks like. That camera is also paired with a dot projector to project dots on your face and make it easier to map. An infrared camera to read those dots and a flood illuminator to add more infrared light if needed. And yes, this is also the exact same setup as the last iPad Pro. This whole setup, of course, it does allow for the well-praised Face ID to work to sign in to the device, as well as to use it for Safari to input your login data on sites, download apps from the App Store, etc. Moving around the device, on the left, we have a microphone, as well as a few of our numerous magnets located around the device. These are useful to connect to accessories like the Apple Smart Keyboard, for example. On the right, we have our volume up and down keys and a magnetic connector to attach the Apple Pencil 2 to. This pencil can be stored there, but it also uses it to pair to the device as well as gets charged by it there. Also, on this side, there would be a nano SIM card tray if this was the LTE model. On the top, we have three microphones used for recording audio and noise cancellation out of a total of five on here, by the way. We have a top button that is used to bring up Siri. You can also say, hey Siri as well with the screen on or off for that matter. You can also tap this button and volume up to get a screenshot, it and volume down and hold them to get power options. And occasionally the iPad will have you double tap it to confirm a purchase. Also on the top, we have two of our four speakers that are on the device. The other two are here on the bottom, which becomes the sides when you're using the iPad in landscape and works better for stereo. We also have our USB-C port here that can be used to charge the 36.71 watt hour battery inside this 12.9 inch model. It's 28.65 watt hours in the 11 inch model, by the way. And so let's do an albeit unscientific test and see how the battery does streaming a 1080p video on 50% brightness. The iPad is also capable of 18 watt fast charging and comes with an 18 watt charger in the box. So again, let's see how that does. Moving around the back of the device, we have our new cameras. First, we have a 12 megapixel F1.8 aperture camera that is the same as the iPad Pro from 2018 and has a sensor size of one third of an inch with 1.22 micron sized pixels. In addition to this model compared to the last iPad Pros, we also have a 10 megapixel F2.4 aperture ultra wide camera with a 125 degree field of view. Really quickly, let's go through the camera modes on the device. Panorama, this lets you start to take a photo and then pan the iPad to have it stitch images together to create a wider panoramic shot. Square, which literally just crops the image to a one by one square. We have portrait mode that only works on the front camera for some reason, but this mode allows you to add a shallow depth of field look to mimic a mirrorless camera with a fast aperture, for example. 
Slow-mo lets you record a video in 1080p at either 120 frames per second to play it back at four times slow motion, or 1080p at 240 frames per second to play it back at eight times slow motion. And finally, we have time-lapse that lets you record a video and it automatically play it back sped up. For video, we can record in up to 4K resolution at 60 frames per second. Lastly, about the camera, we have the addition of a LiDAR sensor. Now, I won't go too in-depth in this video on how this works. Let me know in the comments if you want a full LiDAR decoder episode, which is my new explainer series on the channel, and you can check that out at the link here. But suffice it to say here that LiDAR is basically the light equivalent of radar. So in a nutshell, it uses pulses of lasers to bounce off objects in front of it, and then measures the time it takes for that light to come back to the sensor to determine the size, shape, and distance of things around it. Now, why is that on the iPad Pro? Well, the idea is that it can be used to work better to detect objects for, say, augmented reality. Technically, also portrait mode, I would imagine, would benefit from this, but since that isn't enabled on the rear camera, I can't really test that. The issue here, though, is that Apple has just opened up the API for developers to use this LiDAR sensor to get better spatial maps, etc. But right now, no one has really taken full advantage of it yet, with a few mentioned to be doing so later this year in a press release on Apple's site. Right now, without them updating their code, at least according to that same Apple press release, you will notice, say, things coming in between the AR item and the camera actually more accurately block out that thing as they would in real life, and that apps will feel just a bit more accurate. I can confirm that the Apple Measure app does feel a bit better though, at least. But that's about it, as it'll take time for developers to fully utilize this sensor, and I'm sure it'll make for more accurate AR in general. But I'd venture a guess that most of you watching this don't use many, if any, AR apps very often, so not sure if that'll matter much to you really. And that brings us to the software. The iPad Pro is running the latest iPad OS 13.4, but all previous iPads with an A8 or A8X chip or later will get this update. So that means all of the iPad Pro models, the iPad Air 2 and later, the iPad 5th Gen and later, and the iPad Mini 4 and later. So the experience using any of those devices will be similar to here. Really quickly though, let's go through some of the more notable features of iPad OS. Now, firstly, some features that aren't new, but I think are important to show for anyone who's planning to try and use this device to replace a computer, as many people are curious about that. Now, using it for work, and thanks to the larger size of this iPad, I, and you will probably, almost exclusively use it in landscape mode and maybe connected to a keyboard of some sort, except maybe to write notes on it to more mimic a piece of paper in portrait mode. When doing this, you can set the iPad to put the widgets on the left of your first screen and push your apps on that screen closer together, making for a much better use of the space, in my opinion. Then you can have your dock at the bottom of the screen that auto hides when you're using an app, and you can put any of the apps or folders even in there for quicker access by swiping up on the bottom of the screen only as high as the dock is and letting go. You can then use the dock when an app is already open to tap an app and briefly hold and pull it out and over the current app. You'll then be able to drag it to the right or left to have it take up half the screen with that current app on the other half. And the split in the middle can be dragged to adjust the ratio, or you can slide it all the way over to full screen one of the apps. Once like this, you can use both together, and you can even swipe this up and then bring up the multitasking view, and the collection of two apps will remain that way to be able to go back to easily. You can do this multiple times as well, but as soon as you try to take an app that is in one of these and put it in another one, it'll actually move to the new one and remove itself from the old one. Lastly with this, you can also pull out a third app, or even do this with a second one, and let it go over the other two in the middle to have it become a floating window that will attach itself to the left or right side of the screen. And you can move it from one to the other. If you put it on the right side, you can also swipe this off to the right to dismiss it, but then swipe in from off the right side to bring it back. You can also do this with multiple apps and then use the line at the bottom to swipe left or right on to cycle through them and swipe up on to see all of the apps that have been opened in this sidebar way. Okay, as for new features in iOS 13.4 specifically that are particularly notable. First, we have iCloud folder sharing support now. This means that you can now share folders from your iCloud account in the same way that you share Dropbox or Google Drive folders, just making it a bit more useful. A feature that's super helpful for people with impaired motor skills, but I also think it's something that everyone should maybe check out as it might be useful for power users, for example, is full keyboard access. It's located under accessibility, and once you turn it on, it gives you about 50 customizable keyboard shortcuts that allow you to control the iPad from the connected keyboard. Things like launching apps, but more interestingly, the ability to invoke the notification center, mimic making selections and swipes, multiple finger gestures, etc. And finally, the biggest feature, mouse and trackpad support. 
Now, Apple has always been against putting mouse support into their iPads, and even last June made it clear at the time that the feature was only meant to be used as an accessibility feature first and foremost, meant for users who literally cannot access their devices without a mouse. It would seem Apple, though, has finally decided to add it as a main feature, as it's here now, and not in the accessibility section as it was found in previous betas. Now, regardless, it's a feature that a lot of people have been asking for for a long time, and with iOS 13.4, it's actually here. Now, you simply connect a mouse via Bluetooth, or one of those keyboards with the trackpad built in, as I mentioned, and now you can use it almost as you would a normal mouse. I say almost as Apple has added some of their own flair to the way it works by having the cursor change from a fingertip of sorts to a text cursor based on the context, as well as slightly magnetizing to icons and selectable items on the screen when you get close enough to them. Honestly, it's not a big change from the way that you're used to using a mouse in that respect, and it's just kind of a nice touch. The iPad Pro 2020 is available now starting for $799 for the 11 inch model and $999 for the 12.9 inch model in the Wi-Fi only varieties. You can also add an extra $150 to either of those to get it with LTE connectivity as well. Now, in regards to using the iPad Pro as a computer replacement, I just have a few things that I think are worth mentioning. Firstly, trackpad support isn't implemented terribly well yet. Trying to use it in most apps feels very much like it's an accessibility feature mimicking your finger. But of course, this is to be expected since it is a new feature and it'll take time for developers to adopt it, even if they do. And it'll be interesting to see how they do, i.e. the app recognizes that there is a mouse connected and changes the UI maybe, who knows, and probably not. One app though that does work well with the mouse is Safari. And so I managed to get around a lot of the frustration by simply using the website version of whatever it is I was trying to do, if that was available. Now, the thing I can't get over though, is the fact that with an optional extra of a keyboard and a mouse, even in a single unit like the $299 starting price for the Magic Keyboard, you're looking at about $1,100 or so for the smallest model. Even without looking at another manufacturer, let's stick with Apple. Apple also sells a really good computer starting at $999, the new MacBook Air. Sure, I hear you saying, but what about the ability to draw using the Apple Pencil on it? Okay, well, that's actually another $129 for the Apple Pencil too. Well, Wacom, the company that is super popular for making styluses for computers for professionals, has an entry-level pen and tablet that plugs into your computer, whether it's a PC or Mac, and that's $69. So with that, you get the i5 quad-core model of the Air and a Wacom tablet and pen for just about the same price. But hey, let me know what you guys think about using it as a computer replacement. I'm sure there's some of you out there that maybe your workflow still means that you should use an iPad Pro as your computer more than say that MacBook Air. So let me know about that as well. I'm just honestly really curious. Hope you enjoyed that though, guys. If you did, please thumbs up or share. It's greatly appreciated. Also check out the rest of the channel. If you like what you see there, please subscribe and ding the bell next door subscribe so you get notified when I do new videos. As always though, regardless, thanks for watching.